And let's talk about the gut microbiome and its important role in human health and, and then that communication process between the microbiome and the mitochondria. Yeah, so this is this is uh, an area that, of course, has seen a lot of interest in the last probably two decades, right, and, and maybe even more in in the West. But you know, this is an area that goes back thousands of years, you know, in the in the ancient cultures, right? So from Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, um, and and even some of the indigenous cultures around the world that that don't have sort of names for their systems, they recognize that there's a whole universe inside the gut. And I've heard people like it, medicine men from from uh, you know uh, Colombia tell me that there's a whole universe inside your gut. And this is what they learned in their traditions. And I'm like, holy smokes, like w- they all knew this, right? They recognize that the reality. And so it's it's great that we're waking up to that. And from a su- Western scientific perspective, we're still, it's still so nascent. We don't really know what's going on at the gut. So I, I, I wanna preface whatever I say after, after this, that we still have so much to learn and we're uncovering new things every day and we're, we're changing our stance on a lot of things. But when it comes to the gut, it is the first interface with the outside world other than you know the skin, eyes, and, 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 and sense organs, right? So when we eat foods, whatever we take in, that is, that is where uh, everything is sort of interfacing, right? And, and the gut you can think of is this kind of like hollow tube, right? Where there's a big donut, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we're sticking something inside and then it has to assimilate, right? But inside the gut, of course, is a huge ecosystem. And this is a living, breathing ecosystem of organisms, right? Some we think of as pathogens. Even when we run a, a stool test, you might see pathogens. Well, yes and no. They're only pathogenic when they get out of balance with respect to other things. And even then, oftentimes we, we label something as pathogenic and it may not actually be pathogenic. Like it, it's so nuanced at how this stuff works. But the, re, the, 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 the things that we're confident in um, is that, that we want a lot of diversity, right? A lot of divorce, diversity of organisms. And this makes sense. The, the reason this makes sense is because that gives you adaptability to handle different environmental pressures and stressors, right? So different organisms that you interact with from your food, different food sources, et cetera. But these organisms are also responsible for breaking down some of the food, right? So, uh, you know, when we eat something like uh, blueberries, right? It, it, this is oxidative stress, actually, right? The, the, the anthocyanins in the blueberries, these things are, are pro-oxidation, right? We think about them as, as antioxidants, but it's only the response from the body that we get from these pro-oxidative things, right? So all the plant foods that we can think of with all the colors and the beautiful stressors in them, things like curcumin from turmeric, these type of things, these are stressors, these are plant protectors. So in, in order for, for uh, our body to deal with those, we have to metabolize them. Now, we, you, you need those organisms to actually metabolize the substance. And it's, I think we take it for granted that we all just magically have all these organisms that can metabolize turmeric to the same degree. But but it, it appears that's not the case, right? In fact, um, there's a lot of studies out of Japan related to seaweed and and how uh, the Japanese have have uh, taken up this organism and 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 are able to actually digest seaweed better because they eat so much sushi. So it was an actually an organism that gets transferred from the fish and allows Japanese people to to di- uh, metabolize the seaweed better than other mm-hmm. cultures, right? So in other words, this is, again, it's a living, breathing thing that can happen over generations or even over weeks, constantly shifting and changing because of the environment that it's interacting with. So we need certain organisms. So it's not only what you eat and what you digest, but it's what your microbiome is capable of digesting and metabolizing, yeah. right? So having a healthy, robust, diverse microbiome um, is very, very critical to be able to take advantage of the healthy choices that you're making when you're digesting food and, and choosing the right foods, right? So it's so, so critical. It's the, the microbiome is responsible for so much of what's going on. And the interesting thing, the reason I think it's so um worthwhile talking about the microbiome and the mitochondria connection is because again when i was thinking about aging and trying to understand what are the critical factors of aging what i came up with was that you know dna it's like the, the concept of dna dna itself is the it's the building blocks of life right we, we we can all kind of accept that sure cell membranes are important and fascia is important and the interstitial space it's all important no question but none of it would be here without dna right? So again, human DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and now we've got this microbiome with its own DNA, 
and, and and I'm just using the microbiome as a one organism, but it really it's billions and billions of organisms that all have DNA, their own DNA. So now we've got this ecosystem of DNA in the microbiome in the gut, as well as throughout our body. We have the mitochondrial DNA and we have the human DNA and they are all in communication. So to me, it is the these three things that we need to take care of, that we need to optimize, if you will, for good communication, for good response, for good human genetic expression. So when, when our human DNA starts to fall apart, well, that, that impacts our mitochondria and impacts the, the microbiome. When our microbiome starts to degrade and, and become unhealthy, well, that's going to negatively impact our mitochondria and our DNA. And if we're negatively impacting our mitochondria, that's impacting DNA. So it's all in this three-way communication. So that's why I think it's really, really critical that we, that we um, sort of paint this picture and this idea of why do I want healthy mitochondria? They actually talk to your, your microbiome. If your mitochondria are saying, we need food, we need food, we need food, and there's sort of this, this impaired meta metabolic response or even, even a healthy response, they will communicate. They will send out communication mechanisms in the gut that then communicate to the, the microbes in the gut and to your various cells uh, along the lining of the gut too. So you can see that there's a very interesting communication that takes place and we know this now, this is actually researched very, very well. And we're starting to see some of the, meta, the, 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 the metabolites, the things that when your, your organisms in your gut, when they metabolize food and other matter, um, they will spit out metabolites. And these metabolites are the communication molecules. They are uh, energy resource for the body. So this is a really, really important thing. And, and a lot of research is going into figuring out, you know, what are these sort of postbiotics? What are these metabolites doing and responsible for? And how can we take advantage of them, right? You can imagine a, a pharmaceutical industry, even a supplement industry going, ooh, we know the science now and we have the tools that we can do stuff. Let's go look and see what happens when we give the body, you know, X, X substance, see what it produces and what that what that's going to do downstream. So that's where we're at with a lot of this science. And that's why this conversation is so interesting. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating. And I remember back when I first started my practice back in 2009, gut microbiome research was really just coming out. We didn't know much about postbiotics. And I remember um, you know, I was, I started doing some research on apple cider vinegar and I started promoting it to, to different patients. And I remember a guy telling me, he's like, yeah, I started doing a tablespoon apple cider vinegar and water every day. And he's like, after a week, he's like my blood pressure. Cause he was on, he was on a blood pressure medication. He's like, my blood pressure was, was normal. And I came off my blood pressure medication. It's been, been great ever since. And he's like, that's all I did. And I started thinking, wow. well, what nutrients are in apple cider vinegar? If you look at it, it's not really like nutrients that we especially back then that we were we would classify like is there a lot of vitamin c in it no right is there a lot of vitamin a is there zinc no there's really no nutrients in it it's really just postbiotics and enzymes in there and the kind of acidic nature helps stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system the vagus nerve and so it's really its impact on the nervous system and those postbiotic metabolites that are influencing the communication process in the body, which reduce stress on his system, and now his blood pressure is normal. And I'm sure you've heard stories like that as well. This is what's cool, is that, again, we, we don't even really know some of this stuff yet, right? There's so much to learn when it comes to this, but I, you know, it reminds me of, um, I'm a fan of, of Ayurveda, and I've studied Ayurveda to, to, a, to a degree. I'm not an expert in it, but, but I find that, that there Fundamental lessons are things that we've now uncovered in the West. And they've, for again, for thousands of years, have talked about when the the, the post-digestive effects of certain foods. So in other words, some food um, like uh, like, a, like lime, I think, um, it's very acidic, right? So mm -hmm. typically, typically that would be heating, but in Ayurveda, it's, it's viewed as cooling, right? So these type of things, and, and at, at once it's digested, right? And you hear about it from the sort of alkaline and, and acid kind of vegetarian type crowd, right? Like don't eat an acidic diet and eat a, eat an alkaline diet. And, and, you know, lemons and, and limes are considered uh, alkaline, uh, but really they're acidic. So it, it's pointing to this idea that I think we kind of got some of the theory wrong with some of the stuff. It's not mm -hmm. really about al acid alkaline. It's not an alkalizing diet. There's there's different effects, right? Like the, yeah. the all the 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 um, the probiotic type foods, right? The kefirs and the sauerkrauts and these type of things. Any fermented foods. It, 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 there's so much more going on there. I think when you, when I mean look when you start looking at 
the the biochemistry and the biophysics of a lot of this stuff, you realize, oh my gosh, it's so complex and we're we're oversimplifying a lot of this stuff. So, you know, when it comes to these foods, again, they're healthy for a lot of reasons that I don't think we quite fully understand, to be honest. Um, you know, even rice, you know, I remember years ago when I first learned that that white rice was, you, you, you're after digesting white rice, you produce butyrate. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. You take a basically a, a, a very starchy carbohydrate, right? That raises blood, blood glucose, like through the roof if you eat it plain and a lot of it, but it's producing a fat that is uh, mm. very important for your the health of your colon cells right so this is where kind of when i when i kind of woke up to that idea that a carbohydrate is is then metabolized into a very important fat it made me realize that the old paradigm that i grew up with you know the carbs and the fats and the protein kind of thing the bodybuilder kind of lessons really are just so oversimplified and that that if things are done correctly in the right doses in the right proportions even things like white rice can be a very healthy addition if used in the right way if used incorrectly it can be unbelievably unhealthy right so these things are are are, are, are a lot more complicated but again i think uh, the big thing is do we have a healthy gut that can metabolize mm -hmm. these things and when i run gut tests on people i can see a lot of the strains keystone strains that are missing or that are low rather not they're not missing they're they're just very low and a lot of the sort of more pathogenic type strains when they get out of balance are high right so we start to see these things so the question again remains how do we actually take advantage of this what is it what is there to do about this how do we get a healthy gut and how do we get healthy mitochondria when you when you get that right because as far as i know we're not changing our genes our human genes yet um although i'm sure that's coming unfortunately um but once we get those two equations right now that three-way communication between all the genetic groups can can work optimally mm -hmm.